good morning good morning good morning everybody welcome to arise with sally goodwin on this gorgeous if you can see out my window there um gray overcast so much cooler day than we have had recently it has been so hot in cape town over recent days and whilst you know there are loads of people who love um the heat sorry i'm just trying to find a good space to settle um and i used to be one of them since i have started uh, menopause i no longer love the heat i just my core temperature is hot enough <laughs> and so i just don't love the heat anymore so when these days arrive these beautiful gray overcast days and the wind is blowing and I'm just like oh thank you Jesus <laughs> thank you Jesus for a cooler day good morning beautiful Bertha good morning lovely Venetia good morning good morning ladies so lovely to see you this morning welcome everybody welcome to arise with Sally Goodwin yes Venetia in the same boat as me okay I feel better now that I know there are other people who um who feel the same way it's just it's the heat is just you know i remember being young and spending full days lying on the beach and just you know and i'm just like now that would be a form of torture for me actually to be lying on the beach for days that it's a, like a full day in the hot sun i just couldn't do that anymore so welcome everybody good morning jesse Oh my word, Jessie, so my beautiful friend Jessie is the one who is organizing this Rise in Love um, ladies meeting on the 26th of February 2023, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, it is a Sunday, 1 o'clock in the afternoon at the Anna Beulah Farm in Durbanville. My gorgeous friend Jessie is the one who is organizing that. So I hope that you ladies have all bought your tickets and you're all going to come and support us at that event on that Sunday. Um, I will bring a message and there'll be some prophetic ministry and we're going to see what Holy Spirit does that day, but I'm excited. And so Jessie is saying she's seven months pregnant in this heat. No, Jessie, I actually, my youngest son who is now... 21 he'll be 22 next month he was born in March so I was in my last throes of pregnancy through the middle of February so I know how that feels Jesse I remember <laughs> I remember how that feels uh, Venetia um, Jesse you buy the tickets from Jesse so I posted the I posted the invitation on my Facebook page and Jessie's cell phone number is on the invitation and you just message Jessie and um, and you can get the tickets from her. It would be lovely to see you there. Ladies, come on, we're going to spend some time with the Lord on that Sunday and have some amazing time in His presence. Good morning, Elsa B. Lovely to see you, my friend. And yes, please, um, thank you, Bertha, for reminding me. If you would like and share, please, I would so appreciate it. Um, like and share these videos, not because I um, want my face or my... 53 year old uh, <laughs> my, not that I want my 53 year old face um, spread across the world but I want uh, the words that God has given because I bring my peace to the puzzle and I want these those words to be the ones that are spread um, throughout the world uh, so please like and share as you feel led to do so by the Holy Spirit there we go Venetia Jesse has put her number in the comment section and so for anybody who hasn't yet bought a ticket to Rise in Love, I'm excited to see what the Holy Spirit is going to do that day. Um, Jesse has stepped out in radical obedience, which is the subject of my message today, and organized this event. Um, literally, she has stepped out in radical obedience. She messaged me and said to me, Sally, when is your next ladies event? And I said to her, whenever you organize it, <laughs> because I don't tend to organize these things myself. I just have so much else going on. And I said to her, I don't really organize these things. I pretty much just go where I'm invited. So if you want a ladies event, then feel free to organize one. And she did. 
She went and organized it. She got the venue, she got everything sorted out. There's a light lunch, there's tea and coffee, you know, all of these things. So she stepped out in radical obedience. That is the topic of my message today. Two, three words that God has been speaking to me about. Pilgrimage and radical obedience. And pilgrimage is a very old fashioned word, right? Okay, but let me, before I get into that, let's just start by just saying, ladies, are you seeing the testimonies coming out of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria? Okay, so just let us not for one moment, let us not for one moment downplay the gravity and the tragedy of what has happened in Turkey and Syria. Let us not for one moment downplay that. Let us not for one moment cease to mourn with those who are mourning and grieve with those who are grieving for the, for the I think they've said it's, it's gone to over 40,000 lives that have been lost. So we do not want to lose track of that reality, not for one single second. On the other side of that, in my message that I preached last week, I prophesied that God had shown me a vision. Good morning, Jolene. Lovely to see you, my friend. I think Jolene is one of the ladies who is coming to the Rise in Love event. I'm sure she told me that she is. Uh, so if you know and love Jolene, come join her at the Rise in Love event. So, um, but in my message about, you know, speaking on Turkey and Syria last week, I prophesied and I shared a vision that God had given me of children being um, sustained and ministered to by Jesus and by angelic beings whilst they lie trapped under the rubble. And I, I prophesied that there would be young children rescued from out of the rubble who do not yet have the vocabulary or the language to be able to express what they experienced while they were there but as they get older and God will remind them of who it was who looked after them during that time and then there was a boy, a little boy, I posted it on my Facebook page, my gorgeous friend Linda Faree, who pastors a church in Hermanus, she actually shared the story on her Instagram and I took a screenshot and posted it and it was this little boy who was who was rescued from under the rubble and he'd been under the rubble for days, I forget how long now, but it was four days or something like that, and he said that a man in white had brought him food and water, a man in white had fed them had fed him morning my friend good morning monica yes and and subsequent to that and i haven't posted all of the things on my um, social media because um just because i haven't had a chance but subsequent to that there have been other babies rescued um a baby who's like um it's a tiny baby who's been under the rubble for days on end like something like 180 hours or something like that and he has been rescued and people are saying how did it survive for that length of time without any good morning simone without any um is it simone or do you pronounce your name do you pronounce your name simone or simon um forgive me if i'm pronouncing it incorrectly um, my, I thought I saw a little something on the E, but my eyesight is a shocker. Good morning. <laughs> uh, so, the, so this baby, and you see, we are seeing testimonies of these babies being saved from out from under the rubble, tiny babies, toddlers, um, who actually look remarkably unscathed by what they have gone through. And the rescuers are saying, how did they survive until now? How did they survive under the rubble with no food, no water? And um, ladies, mark my words, I prophesied it last week. We have already seen uh, that the fruit of that prophecy, mark my words, there are going to be more testimonies like that. There are going to be more testimonies like that testimonies of jesus meeting these children in the rubble of the earthquake and they are going to start to remember and they are going to testify their very lives are going to be a testimony unto the king of kings and the lord of lords and we just stand on that that is just it's just god is going to move in the most incredible ways within the destruction and the devastation of what has happened in Turkey and Syria. He is going to move in incredible ways. And we do, absolutely, Venetia, we give all glory to him. So that is the one thing that we are um, that we are seeing. And then the other thing that we are seeing, for those of you who follow 
um, you know, world events and things that are happening around the world, is a revival that has broken out at a university in Kentucky in the United States of America. It is called Asbury University. And it is this, this um, sort of mini revival, for want of a better word, um, it has broken out at this university and it appears to be spreading to other universities within that space. And it, what is amazing about it is that if you go and you read the people who have shared on this, this breakout, it, it is just, so firstly, Asbury University is a multi-denominational university. It's, so it's not a non-denominational university, it is multi-denominational and its, it, it's um, emphasis is actually a Methodism. Good morning, good morning, Tanya. Yes, um, so it's, it's, it actually has a, a quite a Wesleyan or Methodist emphasis, but it is multi-denominational. Um, but it is known for its Wesleyan type holiness. So um, if you know John Wesley and the, the guy who founded the, the Methodist movement, and you remember that all of these movements were founded from a place of um, seeking God, and it was only afterwards as you know, the, the ambitions and the egos of men got involved, that these movements have kind of gone off, you know, the rails a little bit in terms of what God would have wanted for them. However, we do not need, to, we must not forget what they brought to the church and what they brought to Christianity and how many people have given their lives to Jesus because of movements like Methodism across the earth. I was raised Methodist, so I have a soft spot for the Methodists. And so we are, um, so, so here there, there is this revival that is broken out in this university and it was literally just um, students who got together for like a midweek um, prayer or whatever and they just stayed and they stayed worshipping. You cannot tell you, and for those of you who know me well, you will understand where I'm coming from with this. Can I tell you that I read, somebody, um, somebody tweeted uh, who, who had actually gone to check it out for himself and he tweeted there, you know, there isn't a smoke machine in sight. There isn't a well-known um, revival culture movement band. Um, there is somebody on the piano. There is somebody on the guitar. They aren't even playing songs that are really, really kind of modern in terms of worship. Um, there are some um, songs that we would recognize, but a lot of them are songs from kind of vineyard days. Um, they, they, there is nobody preaching. There is no big name apostle or big name prophet who is standing on the stage and ushering in the presence of God. People are getting up to speak. Uh, people, you know, that people are, are lying on the floor, people are weeping, but the one thing that has really kind of um, showed up as being a part of what is happening there is repentance, uh, people weeping before the Lord, people being drawn, students being drawn into repentance, and I have been prophesying again, for those of you who have follow, been following me for a while um, and, and know me well, I have been prophesying for years that the next move of God will be characterized by a fear of the Lord and repentance and there will be more weeping than laughing not because God despises laughter or doesn't want us to be filled with holy joy but because there is a need for us to be flat on, my, on our faces before him and then and so there is this and I have been prophesying that the next move of God, the next awakening, whether this is it remains to be seen, whether this is just a test taster of what is to come, whether this is some kind of foreshadowing of what God is still going to do on the earth, we do not yet know. However, I have prophesied before that the next move of God will not, there will not be one man or one woman even, or one, you know, apostle or one prophet or one whomever who gets to stand in the front and be like this all started with me because that is where they have always fallen down in the past if you know anything about a revival history and the moves of God it's it is going to be what I call a grassroots movement and some of you have heard me prophesy this a grassroots movement where the spirit moves amongst people as he chooses as the Holy Spirit chooses and he sets them on fire for Jesus and that fire brings on repentance it brings on worship it brings on this weeping before the Lord and with that that comes this weighty heavy presence of God that falls in that space as the full force of the Trinity enters in through those living gateways and brings everything that God has the full 
facet of his nature into that space and I have prophesied this for years and all of you who know me would know that this is something that is going to sweep across the earth and it's not that um, it has to begin in America that's not it at all it will begin wherever there are people of God flat on their faces crying out for God to move in amazing and incredible ways it will begin wherever there are people who are of God who are not looking back to what was and expecting God to move the way he's moved before but are looking ahead to where God is and wanting to join God in that space that he is in at the time and these were students mainly but if you go and you have a look you'll see that I saw a post from Daniel Kalenda, you know, he heads up a CFAN and, um, and he, he was there in the early hours of the morning, like quarter to four in the morning. He was sitting in the hall of at Asbury University, just experiencing what Jesus was doing there. And there have been some other kind of big name people, if you want to call them that, who I saw um, have been visiting there. But the students themselves and the faculty of Asbury University have been... Um, praying or, or, or not wanting anybody to come in, any big name, to come in and overtake what God is doing. They don't want somebody. So there have been a few people apparently who have been gently asked to leave because they don't want it to be hijacked by people, by, by people's egos, by people's, you know, they don't want it to be hijacked. They want it to just be Holy Spirit doing what Holy Spirit is doing. And ladies and gentlemen, that is what we need here. And that is what we need to pray into. That is what we need to trust for. That is what we need to seek the Lord for. And we cannot despise the fact that we don't know exactly what the new thing looks like. We need to press in and patiently wait for God to show us and that heart space that we need to occupy is that space of repentance is that space of of humility is that space of we do not have the answers god only you have all the answers for our nation and all the nations on the earth and from the part of that is what i'm going to speak on today is something that god has been speaking to me about it is these words that will not leave my mind or my spirit and two of the words are radical obedience god is speaking to me about radical obedience and i want to just have a look at um, a well, very well-known uh, chapter, a very well-known story in the Bible, in the, I thought I, uh, in the New Testament. I want to just, I want to have a look at this for, and to give you an example of radical obedience. And then the other word that God is just, is in my spirit the whole time is pilgrimage. And you know, Flynn and I are in the space of what I call, what I say to my friends, it's like this betwixt and between space. We are in the space where Flynn and I are people who, in all humility, we desire to live lives of radical obedience to God. We desire to live lives of radical obedience to God. And as such, we make decisions and follow God into places and spaces where not everybody understands. Um, even our children <laughs> don't always I think fully they don't fully get exactly why we're doing what we're doing you know we had a home um, paid off uh, you know the beautiful home that God then told us to sell he then told us to rent you know anybody who had any understanding of finances or or what the, you know it looks like is like you don't sell your house that you don't even owe anything on to go and rent somewhere um, and 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 God called us to do that we moved to Durbanville we lived there for a year then God called us we're now living in Newlands we're still renting um, our lease is up at the end of July we kind of saying to each other are we renewing for another year and we're trusting that we will renew for another year because I have said to the Lord that I, I, I don't want to pack another moving box just give me one more year but the point is this that we want to live in radical obedience which means that we make are making decisions that are not popular with the people who love us because the people who love us they they want us to be safe and they want us to be secure and they want us to be you know to, to be in a space where you know everything makes sense and everything is and we cannot occupy that space and you know what it is there is like a divine 
discontent in my in my spirit and understand me when I say a divine discontent I am not discontented you know like Paul said what well, I'm content with little I've learned to be content with little and I've learned to be content with much I'm content with where I am but there is a divine discontent a, a kind of a stirring a sort of a frustration a, a knowledge that there is something God is doing and I cannot see the fullness of it yet and I want to move in radical obedience to what to whatever that looks like and 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 no matter who you know doesn't understand it or or um or doesn't know where we are going with it it's uh, my my only priority actually is really that that Jesus knows that we are following him and do we miss sometimes what God says absolutely we all do we think God said something and then maybe he didn't actually but God is gracious and he is kind and he's merciful and he's like wow you know what you missed that a little bit but um you just want to be obedient to me I see your heart and that is something that I'm you know that he loves that an obedient surrendered heart I'm many times have I preached about giving him your yes you know we sing songs like you know I surrender all do we really do we even understand what it means to surrender all you know to give it all to Jesus to to give up everything that is secure and safe and you know and 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 find make sense financially to move into a space that doesn't make sense financially because God is calling you to do that and and so this is, you know, Flynn and I, when I preach these things, I want you to understand that I'm not sitting in my mansion, you know, <laughs> um, somewhere and preaching this to all of you and living something completely different. I, as a prophet, I live what I preach. My, my life is, is a sign and a wonder because I live what I preach. What, what I preach when, when God first called me to preach and when he first called me as a prophet, he said to me, you will not preach a sermon that you have not lived so I but the things that I preach are things that I'm living that I live through that I you know when I when I process these things with with all of you this incredible community that I have who follow my lives it is because um, I'm living it and and so when I speak about radical obedience I have a sense of what that looks like and just from that aspect I want to just go to Matthew chapter 4 and you know, because we're heading towards where we're going to be bearing in mind, you know, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Good morning, lovely Jen. Um, we're heading towards that, you know, that space in, in our history. And so we, I want to just have a look a little bit at what Jesus was doing prior to that. And so Jesus, you know, he got in, in Matthew chapter 4, he goes into the desert and he gets tempted by the enemy. And then um, and then he comes out and, the, you know, the angels minister to him and he comes out and then he hears that John has been arrested and put in prison. And so it says in Matthew chapter to 4 verse 12 that Jesus withdraws into Galilee he leaves Nazareth and he goes and he lives in Capernaum okay which is in the country of Zebulun and Naphtali and then it says um, in verse 17 I, I want you to hear all of this so Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 so Jesus is now he's been tempted in the desert he's left he's um, he's heard that John's been arrested so he's come withdrawn out of Galilee he's left Nazareth and he's gone to live in Capernaum which is by the sea okay and so verse 17 it says from that time Jesus began to preach repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, uh, let's, can we just pay attention to the order of events here? Jesus has been tempted in the wilderness. He has heard what's going on in terms of John. He has moved. He has gone to live somewhere else. And he has started to preach. He has not called his disciples yet. He has not gathered any people around him yet. He has started to preach repentance. He has started to preach repentance before he has gathered anybody, before anybody will listen to him. Now, what we need to also understand again, ladies, something that I, that I speak over and over and over to you, we need to understand the context of the times that Jesus was living in. Jesus was not the first person to come forward and claim and, and claim to be the Messiah. Actually, in Jewish history at that time, there were many people, particularly because the Jews were being oppressed by the Romans, 
Romans, there were many people who actually stood up and said that they were the next Messiah. Remember, the Messiah had been prophesied. The, Jew, the Jewish people were expecting him to come as this deliverer to deliver them from um, the Romans, to deliver them from, you know, the, the oppression. And that was how they saw him. And so um, they were expecting a Messiah that it had been prophesied. And there were various people who had risen up and had said that they were the Messiah and they had gathered people to themselves and you know they people joined them like 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 little cults what we would call a little cult today you know and um, people joined them people gathered around them they even walked in signs wonders and miracles signs wonders and miracles were not an unknown thing in those days um you know interacting with the spiritual the, the people from Middle East and people in Middle East and times in biblical times were very spiritual people you know whether they were Jewish or whether they were pagan there were a number of gods people served they, they they knew that there was a spiritual realm they were a lot more spiritual in those days in terms of understanding that there is a spiritual realm that we than we are today the Middle Eastern people particularly they hadn't yet subscribed to the Greek way of thinking which is all everything that's tangible works you know and they knew that there was a spirit realm so they were they were a very you know used to the angelic and 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 evil spirits and things like that and so their people rose up and they called they called people to themselves good morning Sal. morning Celeste lovely to see you my friend and um, they drew people to themselves they told people that they were the next messiah they even walked in signs wonders and miracles the same what signs wonders and miracles that Jesus walked in not necessarily however now if, if you've ever questioned why Jesus kind of always tried to downplay a little bit his signs and his wonders and his miracles you know he healed people and said don't tell anybody you know and we all like why would he do that he was Jesus but because he didn't want people people to follow him for those reasons because other people had come before him and people had followed them for those reasons he wanted people to recognize that he was the Messiah he was the Son of God so understand that Jesus starts preaching in Matthew um, chapter 4 verse 17 he's preaching here but nobody you know here doesn't have a following yet he doesn't have people you know um he doesn't have any disciples yet and he is not the only person who has stood up and called people to repent people knew John John the Baptist that had been John's message repent repent and be baptized the kingdom of heaven is near Jesus now stands up and he is saying the same message repent the kingdom of heaven is near there is no way at that particular point in time that anybody could have known that he was actually the son of God and they had heard other people calling themselves the son of God calling themselves the new Messiah so I want you to understand and the context of where Jesus is for what happens next and so now he goes and so now he's he's started to preach he's telling people to repent he's telling them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and I mean how they didn't realize that it was literally at hand right there in Jesus and then it says that as he was walking by the Sea of Galilee so just imagine this he's he's just walking by the Sea of Galilee it doesn't the Bible doesn't tell us that he was doing it for any particular reason he was just walking along by the Sea of Galilee and he knows notices these two brothers Simon who is called Peter and Andrew his brother throwing a dragnet into the sea for they were fishermen now we need to understand as well this thing about being a fisherman in Israeli times in biblical times okay a fisherman was something if you go further on down to verse 21 and you see James the son of Zebedee and his brother John who were in the boat with their father Zebedee a fisherman was something that you know it was like a family a family business your father did it your grandfather probably did it you know you do it your children will do it you know and the brothers all do it together it's like a family business this is your inheritance this is your legacy and um, you're a fisherman you have a boat this is what you do this is how you're going to raise your children up to do the same thing this was what was you know this was what was your career so if today we would have someone who has a you know a business that says um you know Sally and Sons kind of thing or something like that um, and we just imagine that kind of thing and we all sure that our children are going to follow in the family business and they're going to do you know what will take over and this is our legacy and we're leaving you this business and you get to do this and so this is this is Jewish life this is biblical life at the time this is what an ordinary normal day this was an ordinary normal day and these four men Peter Andrew James and John got up that morning got their little packed lunches got their fishing gear together went down to their boats it was an ordinary normal day they had no idea that in that day their lives were going to change dramatically 
And here comes Jesus and Jesus calls them. And he says, come after me. It says in the Amplified Bible, come after me as disciples, letting me be your guide. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And it says in verse 20, at once they left their nets. Now, ladies, gentlemen, can we take a moment to absorb that? They didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know he was the son of God. They'd obviously heard him preaching. Pardon me. They had heard him preaching. They had heard him speaking. They knew he was out there because it says in verse 17 that he began to preach and he was re preaching repentance and he was preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. But they didn't know. If you read the rest of the gospels and until Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, the disciples vacillated enormously over the three years that they walked with Jesus as to whether he was the son of God or not. And when he was crucified, they doubted completely. They felt like they had chosen the wrong side you know and so here he is but there must have been something about him something about his message that these men immediately left what they were doing and they immediately followed him what set him apart from the rest of the of the crazy people who were saying that they were the messiah and preaching you know john the baptist had been preaching repentance and baptizing people they hadn't followed him John the Baptist had his own disciples who had gathered around him, but these particular four men hadn't followed him. And so it, we, I think, you know, sometimes we read these things in the Bible and we just like, oh, yeah, yeah, and they're going to be fishers of men. And we don't actually understand the fullness of what it took for them to leave everything they knew, everything that was safe, everything that was comfortable, everything that was financially viable, everything that had made sense to generations within their family line, everything they knew, they left and followed him at once. And we also, we just assume that they were just like four men who had no kind of um, strings attached to anybody. But if you go further down and you go into to verse uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 21 and 22, there's James and John, and they're in the boat with their father Zebedee. And they're mending nets and putting them right and getting ready to fish, or maybe they have fished already and they're mending the nets, whatever it is. And Jesus calls them, and in verse 22 it says, At once they left the boat and their father and joined Jesus as disciples. The, these people, these men, they had families. You know, they had, James and John were in the family business with their father. They just up and left their father and his family business and followed Jesus. Do you ever wonder what their families thought? Do you ever wonder what, you know, what they, what their family, did they, you know, did, did they call family meetings and be like, what are we going to do about, you know, I have no more sons to fish in the boats with me. Who's going to come fish with me? And um, who is this Jesus? Why are they following him? And, um, you know, yes, like three, three weeks ago, you know, um, it was, uh, Gideon who stood up and said that he is the Messiah and he gathered people around him and, and this is, you know, and he's now no longer. And, and, you know, a few months ago it was, um, you know, somebody else who stood up and said that they're the Messiah, you know. And so do you think that their families were perturbed by what happened? That their families said to them, how are you going to support yourselves? How are you going to bring in money? How are you going to earn finances? What are you going to do? You're just giving up everything that you know, everything that, you, and you're not even qualified to do this. You haven't studied anywhere. You haven't, you know, can you recite the whole entire Torah? You can't recite the Torah yet. How do you get to go and, and walk with rabbis and teachers and, and preach the word to people if you don't even know the whole Torah yet? You know, can you imagine, just can you imagine the family conversations that took place? We read what, you know, the Bible, biblical text is very flat in places. It gives you just simply the exact things that happen and it doesn't give you any backstory. I'm like, God, when I get into eternity, I want the backstory. <laughs> I want to know, like, what happened? You know, what, what happened to those people? That's why, you know, series like The Chosen are so popular because they fill in some of the blanks in the backstory. It's not necessarily all 100% correct because uh, they're filling in a backstory that nobody fully knows. But the point is that they're just creating a story around Jesus's life and around what he did and making it more accessible to people. You know, where people are like, that actually makes sense to me. Because, I mean, you just read this and you're just like, oh, wow. You know, he, 
He comes out, he moves to Capernaum, he walks, he's wandering along the Sea of Galilee and he calls these people out and they just up and leave immediately. Radical obedience, ladies and gentlemen, radical obedience and they didn't even know who they were being obedient to. There must have been, there must have been something about Jesus that was different. They must have seen something in him, they recognized something in him. Their spirits, their spirits must have recognized something in Jesus that the Holy Spirit must have nudged them. All of those things must have happened, okay? But the point is that they still chose to step out in radical obedience and follow a man that they had no idea yet that he was actually the son of God or anything of what it was going to look like or how it was going to work out. Or they left everything that was safe and secure in their lives and they moved on and they went on this pilgrimage with Jesus. You know, their walk with God, with Jesus was this pilgrimage, you know, um, of of learning about Him and walking with Him and 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 seeing signs and wonders and miracles and understanding who Jesus was. And you know, so all I, I can. In my own sort of words, I imagine that inside of them, God had been stirring up. And these are my own words. There is no scriptural, biblical backup for this. But what I'm saying is, if I look at my own life. I would imagine that there was some kind of divine discontent stirring inside of them. That there was something inside of them that was like, is this it? Is this all there is? Is this what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Is this, you know, um, is, this gonna, is this all there is to life? Like there must have been some kind of divine discontent stirring up within their spirits that when Jesus said, come and be my disciple, they up and left. They were like, here's the answer. This is what I've been waiting for. I knew that there was more to life and this is it. And this is an opportunity that I'm not going to lose out on. I'm going to grab this opportunity with both hands. I'm going to step into it everything Jesus says, you know, Jesus has, and I'm just going to throw caution to the wind and go with him. Radical obedience. They didn't even know what they were being obedient to. They just knew that there was something that stirred up inside of them, that Jesus stirred up inside of them, that they were willing and prepared to leave the, the safety and the security of everything that they had known for their whole entire lives to go with Jesus and be what Jesus called them to be. And bearing in mind that they were all martyred and some of them in the most horrific ways. So it's not even like their parents or their families got to sit back and be like, oh, wow, oh, you know, we doubted what they were doing, but look how well they are doing. Look how well they are doing. They are just like, you know, they are just doing great things. They were doing great things. These 12 men turned the, the world upside down. They were doing great things, but not in a way that would have been construed as acceptable by family members or parents at the time. You know, they were opening themselves up to persecution, opening themselves up to ridicule, opening themselves up to being thrown out of very various places, you know, opening themselves up to to poverty, to, to, to not having all the, you know, the comforts and the things that they might have been accustomed to, opening themselves up to having no one home, no base, just be, just being these people who moved around, you know, the, the space that they occupied, t talking about Jesus. And when Jesus died and was crucified, do you think, when he crucified and died, <laughs> what do you think that their parents or their families might have thought, oh, well, now, now, now they're going to come back, that they'll come back, you know, so Jesus is gone now, well, that was a long three years while we waited for them to see sense but they are going to see sense now because he is in a tomb and they are going to come back and then jesus rose from the dead the body had disappeared and here we you have these your your sons and they're saying to you he's risen from the dead and you're saying you know that the the leaders are saying the body was stolen like let's just not be too crazy about this let's not be too out there let's not be too radical about this come just come home come back to fishing and then you have your son saying no no actually now i'm going to go and preach about this resurrection Jesus in all the places and the spaces that do not want to hear from me and do not want to know what I have to say. I'm going to open myself up to being beaten, to being stoned, to being cast out, to being, to being spat on, to being ridiculed, to being laughed at, to being humiliated. I'm going to open myself up to all of those things. I'm going to go right into the temples and into the spaces where Jewish leaders are and speak the truth and, and possibly and then, and then die for, God, for Jesus. 
yeah. because he died for me. You know, I'm just saying, like, as a parent, for all those out of there who are parents, like, is this something you would like for your child? Like, I'm just saying, would you know, would you be like, yes, you know what, geez, um, darling, I think that's exactly what you should do. I think that's exactly what you should do. You know, I have this incredible friend who has literally just left to go and be a missionary in the Middle East. She has been traveling to and from the Middle East for the last, like it's like a 10 year journey. And, um, and now she is actually physically up and left and gone to live there um, in a nation that is very unsettled with everything that is going on now with, you know, with Russia and Ukraine and Israel and the all thing, always things going on with Israel and the whole Turkey Syria thing. You know, she has literally just moved over there. She is a single, um, a gorgeous single girl, um, Afrikaans girl, you know, um, who, who God called her to this life and her parents have had to come to terms with the fact that their daughter, their one and only gorgeous daughter, is called to be a missionary in one of the most dangerous places on the earth. And as a parent, I sit with God and I'm like, wow, Lord, I'm, you know, how would I cope with that if that was my boys? If, the, if, if that is what you call my boys to, how as a parent, how do I do that? And you know what the only way one does that is, is if one has lived a life of radical obedience to Jesus, then one can, can possibly begin to understand when other people do the same thing. And th this is a word that God gave me. For, for some of you who are watching, for some of you who are listening to me, and I want to just prophesy this over some of you, because I want you to understand that the disciples that James and John and um, Simon and Andrew, I'm getting confused with my, yeah, Simon and Andrew, Simon, Andrew, James and John, they got up this morning and it was a normal day. And by the time the sun went down that evening, it was no longer a normal day for them. It was no longer a normal life for them. It was no longer a normal time for them. Their lives changed completely within the space of one day, within the space of one conversation. Their lives changed completely. That is radical obedience. And I'm prophesying this over some of you who are watching and listening to this um, live and to some of you who are, will be watching and listening the replay later on. Some of you <clears throat> in the months to come, in the months to come, not years, months. <clears throat> and I think they already there are already many of you who know this because you are feeling that like divine discontent, that stirring inside of you that says there must be more, that stirring inside of you that says, Jesus, um, like I feel like you may be calling me to something else. So I prophesy that in the months to come, you will wake up one morning expecting an ordinary day and Jesus is going to step in and he is going to arrest your day and he is going to call you into something for him that will require that you step out in radical obedience in the months to come let me let me get a sense of timing from the holy spirit how many months am i thinking i'm thinking probably four to five months no more than six months Within the next six months, within the next six months, so not, not longer than six months, within the next six months, there are some of you who are going to wake up in the morning to a normal day. And you are going to go about your normal day. And in the midst of your normal day, Jesus is going to enter in. He is going to arrest your day and he is going to call you into something for him that will require radical obedience. And when that happens, I want to hear about it. And when that happens, I want you to remember what it says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 20, where it says, at once they left their nets. At once they didn't they didn't stop to think about it they didn't stop to have a conversation they didn't stop to debate with Jesus what exactly does this look like what are the terms and conditions is there an employment contract who will feed us where will money come from what happens with our families and what happens with the boat do we just leave it here is it going to crumble into pieces because nobody's looking after it what about our assets you know if we have assets what do we do with those things and do can we just go back and just explain to our mom that this is what's happened and can we just go at once they left their nets at once 
and they didn't even know who Jesus was. We know. We know who Jesus was and who Jesus is. So when Jesus calls us into radical obedience, we at least know who we are following. They did not. They did not have the privilege of knowing exactly who they were following yet, and they still did. And they still did. And God is going to do this in the coming months. Be expectant. Be expectant. Wake up every day expecting Jesus to step into your day and change your life like that. Like that, it is going to be life-changing, instantaneously life-changing. Can I just prepare you for the fact that there will be many people, particularly those people who love you and have your best interests at heart, who will not understand what it is that he's calling you to. There are going to be people who will say, are you sure you're hearing God correctly? I, God would never call you into that space. I don't think this is what, right. I don't think this is what you should be doing. I'm worried about, you know, your future. I'm worried about what will happen when you're older. I'm worried about, you know, your financial security. I'm worried about your stability. I'm worried about a million different things. And they will come from a place of love and of good intentions. But they will be a stumbling block to your radical obedience. And you need to recognize that now so that when those words, you hear those words coming from the people who love you, you understand that this is just part of the process, that radical obedience is instantaneously tested. It's instantaneously tested because Jesus calls you, you say yes, and then it's not as if heaven opens up and, you know, immediately there are people and there are, you know, um, entities that perk their ears up and go, oh, hang on a second, like, no, no, this isn't what, you know, um, uh, sorry, what, 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 no, no, you know, and so expect, be expectant, but I'm releasing this as a prophetic word, and for some of you, if you're thinking, oh, well, I have another six months, for some of you, it is going to be much sooner than that. I just, God said months to me, it will be less than six months, not more than six months. So I'm thinking four to five months, but, but for some of you, it's going to be sooner. For some of you, you're going to be messaging me in like a week's time and saying to me, Sally, um, remember that radical obedience thing. For some of you, God is taking you on a journey. He is taking you on a, a, a pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is such an old-fashioned word, and we don't use it anymore, particularly when, when we talk about pilgrimage. I mean, I think we, we imagine the Muslims you know, going on pilgrimage to Mecca and things like that. And But we don't realize the Jews lived a life of pilgrimage. You know, they, when the Jewish people in Jesus' time and before him, they, they had to go to the temple to do their sacrifices. They had to go to the temple for every feast day. They went on a pilgrimage every time there was a feast because they had to go from the to the temple and they didn't all live in Jerusalem so they traveled you know you read the story of Jesus traveling with his parents to Jerusalem and it was only they were a day out already before they realized that he'd stayed behind so the Jewish people they lived a life of pilgrimage they they understood going on this pilgrimage to you know to to the to do the feasts and to to be obedient to what God had called them to and for some of us, the pilgrimage is a, is a spiritual journey that we, we, all, we are all on a pilgrimage because we are all on a life's journey with Jesus. But for some of us, that pilgrimage will stay a spiritual journey. For some of us, that pilgrimage is going to be a physical journey. It is going to be a physical relocation. It is going to be a physical sign of what God is doing in your life. So if you start hearing the words pilgrimage, then you know that God is calling you. And you know, radical obedience and pilgrimage are always outside our comfort zone. <laughs> they are always outside our comfort zone. They are always going to be outside our comfort zone. Radical obedience within your comfort zone is not radical obedience. It's just doing what God has told you to do. You know, radical obedience and pilgrimage are always outside of our comfort zones. So whatever it is that Jesus calls you, know and understand that it's going to be uncomfortable. Know and understand that there will be people who don't get it. Know and understand that even in three years time or four years time or 10 years time, there will still be people who don't get it. But as long as your heart is positioned in repentance and humility before God, and you are willing and surrendered and have given him your yes, he is not going to let you fall. He is not going to let you fail. He is going to be there to carry you through. All he needs from you is to get up at once. When that call comes, it is an at once moment. And there are many of you listening to this who are going to be called into an at once moment 
in the coming months. There will be a moment and the answer will have to come at once. So I just bless you right now with wisdom and revelation. I bless you with peace and understanding. I bless you to clearly hear the voice of the Lord when he speaks. I decree and declare this prophecy over each and every one of you that God is highlighting to me now that is going to be stepping into the space of pilgrimage and radical obedience. And I just decree and declare your spiritual ears open, your spiritual eyes open, your spiritual senses opened to fully hear and know that it is the voice of God calling you into this pilgrimage, calling you into this radical obedience. I decree and declare that over you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and I prophesy radical obedience as your destiny in Jesus name. In Jesus name. So bless you, each and every one of you. I'm excited to hear testimonies of what God does in your lives in the coming months. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as can possibly make it to the Rise in Love um, ladies event on Sunday the 26th of February, 1 o'clock at the Anna Beulah Farm. Absolutely, my friend. Give him your yes. You won't regret it. It's not comfortable and it's not always easy, but you'll never regret it. Love you ladies and gentlemen. Good to see you all. I will see you again on Friday at 7 o'clock in the morning. Mwah. Have a superb Wednesday. A superb Wednesday.